God. Now, in addition then to Nephi and to Abinadi, the Savior himself discusses this. Third Nephi, chapter 16, as he deals with this subject, for instance, uh, verse 20, you have this statement. Uh, and again, he's talking about Zion, as it's clear from the verses preceding it. Thy watchmen shall lift up the voice, with the voice together shall they sing. They shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. And then he says in verse 20, The Lord hath made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all nations. Now he says the same thing also in 3 Nephi 20 and 35. See? Now what does it mean then to make bare his arm in the eyes of all nations? Well, let me give you an example. He did this kind of thing once anciently. There was once a nation where the Lord made bare his arm and manifest his power in great judgments and plagues and manifest his glory as a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. What was that nation? And the answer is Egypt. Okay? And with power he brought forth and delivered his people out of Egypt. Now let me put it this way. There's going to be little Egypts all over the earth in the last days. There will be people, for example, in Germany, France, Italy, England, the countries of the world, and when this era of warfare takes place and the mother of abominations gathers multitudes from among the Gentiles to fight against Zion, then Nephi says, I beheld the power of God in great glory descended upon the saints of the Lamb, upon the covenant people of the Lord. And where were these people? They were in these various countries of the earth where the church has been established. And where, by the way, now there are temples. Temples not only for the work for the dead and for the facilitating of the basic ordinances of the gospel to the saints, but temples where they can retreat and where they can be given spiritual direction and through the sacred ordinances of which the powers of the Spirit will be developed in their midst. And as those powers are developed, and the Lord steps in to preserve them, then the ensign of Zion will be raised among all people. And these people then will be preserved by the glory and power of the Lord. And meantime, in the whole scenario, Zion will be the first of, here in America, the first group to be, to be cleansed. And the end result of this cleansing is going to be the establishment of the Lord's kingdom, the establishment of Zion with glory and with power, the cleansing of America, and the establishment of the Lord's throne. And then as warfare is made against the outlying areas of Zion, then the Lord will begin to gather his people, and he will say, don't go in haste, no reason, I'm going to be, go before you and I will be your rearward, 3 Nephi 20 and 21, okay? And you go then out slowly, and you gather as many people as you can to go with you. Why? Because if they stay behind, what's the other alternative? What is the alternative Nephi saw? If they reject this, they'll be brought down into judgment both spiritually and temporally. You see that? That is the general picture. Now Nephi sees that. And he explains here, going back to verse 10 of 1 Nephi 22, I would, my brethren, that you should know, now you have got to know this, that all kindreds of the earth cannot be blessed. The forces of iniquity and the powers of the unrighteous are such that all nations of the earth cannot be blessed unless he shall make bare his arm in the eyes of all nations. And how is he going to do it? Through his people who are in their midst and who's, where the glory and power is mani made manifest to preserve them. And then he goes on, he says, Wherefore the Lord God will proceed to make bare his arm in the eyes of all nations in bringing about his covenants and his gospel unto those who are the house of Israel. Remember we read 1 Nephi 14, verse 17, where he says that in this era of warfare he's going to perform a preparatory work that preparatory work in the era of warfare or prepares for the gathering of Israel will be the cleansing of the saints and the cleansing of America 
and then he will begin the great world gathering that's foretold in the scriptures, see. And he says, uh, wherefore he will bring them again out of captivity, and they shall be gathered together to the lands of their inheritance. And they shall be brought out of obscurity and out of darkness, and they shall know that the Lord is their Savior and their Redeemer, the Mighty One of Israel. Now this is a time when his arm is made bare, and they know it. And the blood of that great and abominable church, which is the whore of all the earth, shall turn upon their own heads, and they shall war among themselves, and the sword of their own hands shall fall upon their own heads, and they shall be drunken with their own blood. And every nation that shall make war against the old house of Israel shall be turned one against another, and they shall fall into the pit which they dig to ensnare the people of the Lord. And all that fight against Zion shall be destroyed. And that great whore who hath perverted the right ways of the Lord, yea, that great and abominable church, shall tumble to the dust, and great shall be the fall thereof. For behold, saith the prophet, the time cometh speedily that Satan shall have no more power over the hearts of the children of men. For the day soon cometh that all the proud, and they that do wickedly, shall be a stubble, and the day cometh that they must be burned. Now, is that a glorious picture? It's a rough one, isn't it, see? Does that in mind indicate that Zion is going to simply sit on the side and watch it? No, Zion is going to be right involved. This is a warfare against Zion. This is the era of warfare against Zion. All right, let's read now, for example, Nephi's explanation further. He says, For the time soon cometh that the fullness of the wrath of God shall be poured out upon all the children of men. For he will not suffer the wicked shall destroy the righteous. Wherefore, he will preserve the righteous by his power, even if it so be that the fullness of his wrath must come, and the righteous be preserved even unto the destruction of their enemies by fire. Wherefore, the righteous need not fear, for thus saith the prophet, they shall be saved, even if it so be as by fire. Behold, my brethren, I say unto you that these things must shortly come, yea, even blood and fire and vapor must come, and it must needs uh, be upon the face of the earth, and it cometh unto men according to the flesh, if it so be that they will harden their hearts against the Holy One of Israel. For behold, the righteous must shall not perish, for the time surely must come that all they that fight against Zion shall be cut off. And the Lord uh, uh, will surely prepare the way for his people unto the fulfilling of the words of Moses, where he talks about if they reject Christ, then they'll finally be cut off. And then he goes on and speaks of the ushering of the millennial kingdom. Now, let me ask you, just read that for yourself, but let's turn to another explanation on this whole theme. Now, this is 2 Nephi chapter 6. Now, in 2 Nephi chapter 6, Jacob comes back to the same theme. He comes back to the same theme, and he talks about it. I want to get into it in relation to the Isaiah passages tomorrow evening, so I only want to give you part of it here. Let's turn, for example, to four. They that fight against Zion and the covenant people of the Lord shall lick up the dust of their feet, and the people of the Lord shall not be ashamed, for the, Lord, for the, pe for the people of the Lord are they who wait for him, for they shall wait for the coming of the Messiah. And behold, according to the words of the prophet, the Messiah shall set his hand again the second time uh, to recover his people, wherefore he will manifest himself unto them in power and great glory. Now, this is a real power situation. And he goes on to say, under the destruction of their enemies, when that day cometh, when they shall believe in him, and none will he destroy that believe in him. And they that believe not in him shall be destroyed both by fire and by tempest and by earthquake and by bloodshed and by pestilence and by famine, and they shall know that the Lord is God, the Holy One of Israel. Now I'll pay particular attention to verse 16 and 17. For behold the prey, for behold shall the prey, rather, be taken from the mighty or the captive, lawful captive delivered. Now that's a question. Who is the prey? And the answer is Zion. All right, and so we ask the question, for shall the prey, i.e., Zion, 
be taken from the mighty and the lawful captive delivered? But thus saith the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. For the mighty God shall deliver his covenant people, for thus saith the Lord, I will contend with them that contend with thee, and I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh, and they shall be drunken with their own blood as with sweet wine, and all flesh shall know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. Now can you see the general picture? Now this is the Book of Mormon, my brothers and sisters. To many of us there are two sealed books. One is the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon, and the other is this thing from which I've been reading. <laughs> now that's true, and I don't want to be negative on that, but ask yourself, do you understand the era of warfare against Zion? It's a sealed record to many of us. Now let me turn now finally to Christ's explanations. Now, Nephi gives us the basic theme. It's amplified by his brother Jacob. And then when the Savior comes to the Nephites, he really blossoms the picture out and teaches it in some detail, all the record of which we don't have, because Mormon was told not to write the full thing. But nevertheless, he explained it in detail. Why? Well, because this is the day when Israel is going to be redeemed. This is the day when those people among the Nephites to whom he was speaking, their posterity, were going to come in and build the new Jerusalem. And so he told them about it, and he told them in detail what would take place. Now, in that sense, then, the Savior gives significant, highly significant explanations. Now, let's turn to some of them. The prophetic picture in 3 Nephi begins about 3 Nephi 16. And in 3 Nephi 16, he's talking now about the Gentiles, and again, he's saying some rather unsavory things about them if they don't repent. He always leaves the door open. If they will repent, then fine. He's got his arms wide open, ready to receive them. But if they don't repent, then this is another ballgame. Now, in 3 Nephi 16, verse 10, he says, Thus commanded the Father that I should say unto you, At that day, when the Gentiles shall sin against my gospel and shall be lifted up in the pride of their hearts above all nations, and uh, above all the people of the whole earth, and shall be filled with all manner of lyings, and deceits, and of mischiefs, and all manner of hypocrisy, and murders, and priestcrafts, and whoredoms, and of secret abominations, and if they shall do all those things, and shall reject the fullness of my gospel, behold, saith the Father, I will bring the fullness of my gospel among them. Now, are we somewhere near that, that picture today? Now he goes on and he says, And then I will remember my covenant which I have made unto my people, O house of Israel. And I will show unto thee, O house of Israel, that the Gentiles shall not have power over you. He's going to break the power of the Gentiles, and they will not have power over the Indian people. And he goes on to say, I will, And I will remember the covenant unto you, O house of Israel, and ye shall come unto the knowledge of the fullness of my gospel. But then he clarifies, Now if the Gentiles will repent and return unto me, saith the Father, behold, they shall be unnumbered among the people of, of the Lord. And he says, I will not suffer my people who are of the house of Israel, to go through among them and tread them down, saith the Father. But if they will not repent and turn unto me and hearken in my voice, I will suffer them, yea, I will suffer my people, the house of Israel, they shall go through among them and they shall tread them down and you'll be a salt that's lost its savor, which is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of man. And he goes on to talk about the fulfillment of the Lord's covenants at that time. When I was back at Syracuse University on my doctor's degree, I wrote a doctoral dissertation on Joseph Smith. That was one of the most interesting, challenging experiences a human being can have. You go to an Eastern University and you have the audacity to write a doctor's dissertation on Joseph Smith 
and uh, tell the people about the guy and do it without qualifying or without rationalizing and without writing him off for what he really is. As I uh, got a committee together to consider the topic, I uh, had there in the committee the head of the history department and prominent men all over the university, and they were going to listen to my proposal on what I should write and give their consent or the rejection of the proposal. So it wasn't a matter of bearing your testimony and walking out and shaking the dust off your feet. You had to get their consent. <clears throat> well, as I sat there, the first question that was asked me by a cynical, sophisticated, erudite history professor who was head of the department was, now, Mr. Andrus, uh, where did Joe Smith get his ideas? Now, I could have told him that, but that would have been the close of the chapter, and I knew it. And yet I also knew that I wasn't going to compromise. And I sat there for about a full minute and never said a word. My mind was just racing. What am I going to tell this guy? I could bear him a testimony, but what am I going to tell this guy to get him in my corner and to get him to give consent? And finally, he spoke again. He said, well, now, Mr. Anders, you know <clears throat> that any time any great mind of any significance brings forth any ideas, he gets them from some other people, and then he puts them together in a new combination. What now did Joseph Smith read before he gave you the Book of Mormon? Now, I knew that Joseph Smith couldn't spell the word February without using the German thumb before he got the Book of Mormon. That's what Emma said anyway. <clears throat> well, so finally, finally I says, well, he really didn't read anything. And you know, that's an affront to a, to a dignified group like that. Here I have the audacity to invite them to take their time to come to a meeting to consider me writing a doctoral dissertation on a guy who never read anything. <laughs> what do I think of them? <clears throat> and so, wow, the thing just built. And finally, I said, well, sir, he claimed to receive it by revelation. And uh, I would want to entertain that possibility, not in the sense of championing the idea of revelation, but of analyzing his claim, whether it's original, whether there are other ideas that you could say legitimately he had borrowed from. Well, then the hassle broke out, and for two hours we went round and round the circle. And finally, this old history professor pulled his glasses down on his nose like that and said, Well, <clears throat> Mr. Andrus, if you're going to find out where Joe Smith got his ideas, you better find out who inspired the Holy Ghost to inspire Joseph Smith. <laughs> and right at that point, I bowed my head and said the most brief and effectual prayer of my life. I said simply, Lord, I've got to have some help. I simply got to have it. And I'd no more than quit praying, and it was all just an utterance, than one of the prominent members of that committee, a very prominent and distinguished woman, enough so that when the Prime Minister of England came to America, she was in the, the reception line visiting, greeting him. She stood up and says, hey, fellas, we're not getting anywhere. <laughs> that was the statement of the day. <laughs> and she says, it looks to me like, and it must have been some prior discussion on it before, the, looks to me like if there is anything done, this, this might be something that would be assigned to me. And so I propose that I meet with Mr. Andrus privately and take a look at this situation and see if there's anything worthy of a doctoral dissertation. And then we'll get together. And so with that, the meeting broke up. 
and I went home and literally went to bed, totally exhausted, just totally exhausted with emotional stress. Well, next day or so, I took my master's thesis, which was on Joseph Smith's idea of the world government. I took Joseph Smith's plat of the city of Zion. I took some of his stuff on the 1844 campaign into Seer. She looked it all over and she said, yeah, yeah, there's something here. And she was that kind of a gal back in the days when women's lib was just in its incipient stages, very beginning stages. She was that kind of a gal who would like to pull things over her fellow faculty. And she took it upon herself to champion my cause. But she says, hey, we can't get this through committee. It just can't be done. You can't do it. He said, well, I'll tell you what, let's do. And so she proposed that we work out a system of hand signals. If she put her hand on her ear like that, that meant whom we go this way in the discussion. We propose this. If she sat there like that, that meant something else. And we wrote all those hand signals down, and I memorized them. And we went back into committee, and this time we pulled it off. And I was given the right by an Eastern University as a returned Mormon missionary to write a doctoral dissertation on Joseph Smith, and I never pulled any punches. Now, in the course of that doctoral dissertation, I had, I discussed part of the prophet's prophetic picture, and I quoted 3 Nephi 16 about the remnants of Jacob going through the Gentiles. That prophecy is made three times by the Savior, 3 Nephi 16, 3 Nephi 20, and 3 Nephi 21. I put that in there, and the situation by that point had got to such a state. This uh, woman had uh, some kind of a federal grant to tour the earth and study the Oriental people and study in the Philippines. She came to me and she said, Mr. Anders, I wonder if you and your wife would live in my home while I'm gone for this next year. Now, she's my chairman, okay? And she had uh, three of these little registered dash hound poodles. They had such a pedigree to them that I had to really think seriously, with great meaning and, and uh, uh, assert myself that I was a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through Ephraim in order to live in the same house with those critters. <laughs> I mean, they were high-blooded things, and she left me a whole packet of money, five, six hundred dollars or so to feed them, and she took off then uh, to the Philippines and to India, China, and so forth, and I started writing my dissertation in her study which had books all over right in my whole field, and we lived in a beautiful home, oriental rugs and all of that. Well, I knew that just as soon as I shipped her a chapter on the spiritual foundations of Zion, that that was closed chapter for me, that my opportunity to write on Joseph Smith would be terminated. And so I sat down and thought about it. The next chapter after spiritual foundations was the one on economics, Joseph Smith's idea of a new economics. And so instead of shipping off the chapter on the spiritual foundations, I waited until I got the chapter written on economics. And then I fired off the chapter on the spiritual foundations, and about three days later, and I'm sending them airmail now to the Philippines, and about three days later I fired off the chapter on economics. And then I sat back and waited. <laughs> well, a couple of weeks later, I got a letter just sizzling. Where she says, Dear Mr. Andrus, this is Curtains. I simply cannot support you. We can't get this thing through. It's foolhardy. And there's no possibility of getting a dissertation on this if this chapter's in there. And uh, I have written the university and canceled out being your chairman. I regret that. I have been forced to do that. I just can't, I can't support it. And I can't get it through committee with you. I'd like to, but I can't. And we might as well admit defeat right now. Well, about three days later, I got another letter. <laughs> the chapter on economics rolled through. 
and she read the chapter on economics. And then I got the letter and she said, hey, I have reconsidered. Got your latest chapter. There is something here, but seriously, I can't take the responsibility myself. I have written another letter to the administration of the university, and I have told them that I will not take sole responsibility as your chairman. You've got to put this chairman of the history professor on committee as a joint chairman of your committee. And so old Dr. Hotchkiss then was put right on that committee with her. And he was that cynical old beggar who wanted to know where Joe Smith got his ideas. <clears throat> and he did me one of the greatest services that a human being could do. He, is a, he was a Van Ronkian historian. The philosophy of laying down the chips, let them fly where they may, just point out the facts. And uh, he would read through that thing with a fine tooth comb. When I put these chapters in, they went first of all to my the first professor, then back to me, then to Hotchkiss, and then back to me. And when I got this thing in Third Nephi put in there, in big bold letters right across the page, he wrote B O S H exclamation, 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 underlined, underlined, underlined. And that's what he said about the Savior's prophecy. Bosh. Well, I got over that hurdle <clears throat> and finally got my dissertation written. And then the time came to defend it. Now, keep in mind, these two folks had read that thing two times with a fine tooth comb. We went to that uh, committee. Some of the men who were on it, they're drawn from all the areas of the university, just picked up the dissertation, read enough in it to know that it, it's spiritual flavor, and just went straight in the air. Well, we went to the defense of it, and I spent two hours then with them, pummeled and bombarded, but I defended it. And uh, then it's customary when you get through with that two or three hour bombardment, that they invite the candidate out for a while, and then they talk maybe five, ten minutes or so, and invite you back in to tell you their decision. So they invited me to step out. Five minutes went by, ten minutes, fifteen, twenty, half hour, etc., etc. And finally, the door opened and they invited me in. And the first person to come out was this chairman, this woman, and she was just furious. She was literally cursing. I'm talking about real, blue, blue flame cursing <laughs> her fellow colleagues. And they all streamed out. She had signed the dissertation, and I got my degree. But. Uh, under circumstances where finally, after the battle got underway there, finally these two people, the old history professor who was a Von Ronkian historian and who had been through that thing twice, and then her, they finally stood up together and said, look, fellas, we have been through this thing two times with fine tooth comb. You haven't even, some of you, read it. You blankety blank SOBs. And with that then, the other people bowed down and cowed down. She signed the dissertation, and I got a doctor's degree. Oh, just a little interlude here. But it relates now to the view of things. Now you take a look at this. If the Indian people arose in rebellion in America, what would the American Gentiles do? They'd call in the Marines. And that would take care of it, wouldn't it? Now, what is the Lord saying, though? What is the Lord saying? The Lord is saying that a set of situations or circumstances will so happen, will take place so that eventually, if the Gentiles don't repent, that the remnant of Jacob on this land will go through 
the, in the Gentiles, and they will be like a lion in the midst of the, the beasts of the forest, and like a young lion in a flock of sheep, who, if he goes through, both treads down and tramples in pieces, and none can deliver. And he makes that statement three times. I've read to you 3rd Nephi 16, let me turn to 3rd Nephi 20. This is uh, verse 15 to 22. Note what he says now. And I said that if the Gentiles do not repent after the blessing which they shall receive after they have scattered my people, then shall ye who are a remnant of the house of Jacob go forth among, uh, go forth among them, and ye shall be in the midst of them who shall be many. Now note that the Gentiles are many in comparison. And ye shall be among them as a lion among the beasts of the forest, and as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who, if he goeth through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. And then he goes on to say, Thy hand shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries, and thine enemies shall be cut off, and I will gather my people together as a man gathereth his sheaves unto the floor. Now this is a, another scenario of this great gathering of Israel. Israel's gathered from the Gentile nations, and they go out not in haste, because the Lord goes before them, and he is their rearward. Now, meantime, you're going to gather also his people here in America. And he goes on and says, For it, I will make my people with whom the Father hath covenanted, yea, I will make thy horn iron, and horn is a symbol of power, and I will make thy hooves brass, and that's the instrument uh, of destruction. And they shall beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord, and their substance to the Lord of the whole earth. And behold, I am he who doeth it, and it shall come to pass, saith the Father, that the sword of my justice shall hang over them, the Gentiles, that is, at that day. And except they repent, it shall fall upon them, saith the Father, yea, even upon all the nations of the Gentiles. And it shall come to pass that I will establish my people, O house of Israel, and behold, this people will I establish in this land under the fulfilling of the covenant which I made with your father Jacob, and it shall be a new Jerusalem, and it shall, and the powers of heaven shall be in the midst of this people, yea, even I will be in the midst of you. Now can you begin to get that picture? When this situation happens then, it finally leads into the establishment of the new Jerusalem. It leads to the sanctification of the Lord's people and the Lord himself will come and dwell with his people prior to his great world coming. Now, in connection with this, for example, read Isaiah 59, verse 19 and verse 20. Note how Isaiah puts it. He says, for example, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Now, can you see that as Nephi saw it? And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord." All right, now having explained this then, then the Savior gives us the most detailed information on it, and it's here then where things begin to unfold and you begin to see the real meaning of the whole scenario. And this is 3 Nephi 21. Now here then he begins by, by uh, uh, explaining about the remnant, verse 12, which says, My people who are of the remnant of the Jacob shall be among the Gentiles, yea, in the midst of them as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who, if he go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Their hands shall be lifted up upon their adversaries, and all their enemies shall be cut off. Yea, woe be unto the Gentiles except they repent. For it should come to pass in that day. Now, what's the antecedent to that day? That's the day that the Indian people play, not cowboy and Indians, but Indians and cowboys. <clears throat> okay, that's the day when, that, when, when the shoe is on the other foot in relation to things, okay? And he says, Woe unto the Gentiles, except they repent, for it should come to pass in that day, saith the Father, I will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee, and I will destroy thy chariots. Now, this is Old Testament terminology. What does it mean to cut off our horses out of the midst of thee and destroy our chariots? What's it talking about? It's talking about transportation, right? And he says, And I will cut off the cities of thy land, and throw down all thy strongholds. Now, he's talking about our beloved America. Now, this comes pretty close to home. 
And he says, And I will cut off witchcraft out of thy land. All this devil worship is going to go by the way. And uh, thou shalt no more worship, uh, and thou shalt not ha have no more soothsayers. Thy graven images will I also cut off, and thy standing images out of the midst of thee, and thou shalt no more worship the work of thy hands. This whole era of materialism, crass materialism, is going to pass away. And he goes on to say, I will pluck up thy groves out of the midst of thee, and so will I destroy thy cities. Now, groves in ancient Israel were places of worship. Their modern equivalent then are cathedrals and great churches and so forth. And I will destroy thy cities. And it shall come to pass that all lyings and deceivings and envyings and strifes and priestcrafts and whoredoms shall be done away in this land. Okay? For it shall come to pass, saith the Father, I will, that at that day whosoever will not repent and come unto my beloved Son, then will I cut off from among my people O house of Israel, and I will execute vengeance and fury upon them, even upon the heathen, such as they have not heard. Now, this chapter, this set, uh, statement that I've read you comes from where? It's Old Testament terminology. Where does it come from? It's taken lock, stock, and barrel out of the fifth chapter of Micah. Now, that's important. And it's important for us to go back and read the prophecy as Micah gave it, as Jesus expressed it and gave it to us, he applied it to the American Gentiles, if we do not as a people repent, then these circumstances will take place. All right, now let's go back to Micah and pick it up. As uh, Micah gives it to us uh, from his day as he looks down to our time. He's speaking now here in this prophecy about Christ. And it's this prophecy that tells us where Christ is going to be born. He says, for example, verse 2, But thou, O Bethlehem Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall come forth unto me, uh, that is to rule, uh, that is to be a ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Now, when the Jews wanted to know where the Messiah was going to be born, where did they, they point? Micah chapter 5. You see that? Jesus, this ruler whose goings forth has been from of old, from, eternity, from everlasting, is going to be born in Bethlehem. Okay? Now, that's important point. But the whole chapter then, beginning with... The focus on Christ and his birth is a prophecy about a latter-day Assyrian that's going to come into a land and, ha ra and raise great havoc and judgment. That's what the prophecy is about. And about Christ being the deliverer of his people when the Assyrian comes. Now, let's read on. He says, uh, uh, verse 3, Therefore, Will he, that is, this person who's born in Jerusalem, who's, I mean, in Bethlehem, who's really the God of Israel, who's been from everlasting, therefore will he give them, that is, Israel, up? He's going to forsake them because of their wickedness and scatter them throughout the whole world, see? Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. Now, who is it that's going to travail and bring forth and be the key for the gathering of Israel? Well, he's talking about Zion. He's going to give Israel up until after Zion has travailed and been cleansed and brings forth, and then he's going to do his work of gathering Israel. All right, therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth, that is Zion, then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. And he, this person born in Bethlehem, shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide, and now shall he be great unto the ends of all the earth. See, Zion is going to be established, and he'll be great to the ends of, of the earth. And this man, this one who was born in Bethlehem, this man shall be the peace 
when the Assyrian shall come into our land. Now this is not ancient Assyria. This, this Assyrian is something after Christ, right? And he's talking now about Christ's deliverance of his people. And Jesus applied then what is said thereafter to America and to the situation that will prevail in America. All right, he says, And this man shall be the peace when the Assyrians shall come into our land, and when he shall tread in our palaces. Then shall we raise against him, that is the Assyrian, seven shepherds and eight principal men, and this is talking about the deliverance process, and they shall waste the land of Assyria with the, with the sword and the land of Nimrod in the entrances thereof. Thus shall he, this person now who is born in Bethlehem, deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land and when he treadeth within our borders. And the remnant of Jacob, now here is the part that Jesus now quotes, and the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many people as a dew from the Lord and as the showers upon the grass that tarrieth not for man nor waited for the sons of men. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people as a lion among the beasts of the forest and as a young lion among the flocks of sheep who, if he go through, both tread down and teareth in pieces and none can deliver. Thine hand shall be lifted upon thy adversaries and all thy enemies shall cut off. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that I will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee, and I will destroy thy chariots. Now that's 3rd Nephi 21, isn't it? That's the whole thing there, see? And I will cut off witchcraft out of thy land, and thou shalt have no more soothsayers, and thy graven images also shall be cut off, and standing images out of the midst of thee, and I will pluck up thy groves, and I will execute vengeance and fury upon them, such as they have the heathen has not heard, see? All right, now what does all that mean? See, that's the context in which and Jesus just excerpt part of that and put it in and says it applies to America. Now when the Indian people go through, the remnant of Jacob goes through, and that will include more than the Indian people, by the way. It includes all Israel, as President Joseph Fielding Smith once made clear. But when they go through among the Gentiles, it will be after the coming of the Assyrian. And what will the Assyrian do? The Lord will send him against the hypocritical nation. It will be the great northern army. And as Joel said in the last verse of the second chapter of Joel, when the Assyrian army has been driven back, the saints are purified, then the Lord will begin pouring out his flesh upon all people. And he'll start with Zion. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall have dreams. And then he goes on and says, that there will be three places of deliverance, Mount Zion, Jerusalem, and the remnant whom the Lord shall call. You see that? How this old professor was pretty well on target in writing Bosch all over that paper? He was. I mean, if we had that kind of an uprising with the military might of America back in 1955 when that took place, we'd just send out the Marines and that would be it. And for Joseph Smith to make some kind of a prophecy that would ever happen is absurd. But if we put this prophecy in its proper context, see it now in relation to the whole warfare against Zion, and view it under those circumstances, then, you see, after the Assyrian has been through, what happens to the Gentile, the American economy and polity? I hate to think of it. On the other hand, I hate to think of the maniacal way in which we are handling our affairs, both political and economic, particularly our economic. And, but the problem isn't that. The problem essentially is the spiritual and moral decadence of our country. That is essentially the problem. And we are not, as Brigham Young said, keeping the broad road to destruction. We're going instead cross lots to hell. And how long we can continue that, I don't know. But in the midst of this, you're going to have a situation finally where the American Gentiles raise up and begin to make war against Zion. And this will begin, this era of warfare against Zion. It may be when someone tries to scrap the Constitution, and there's already those who would like to do that, and they have their proposals in gear, and it only takes a couple more states to ratify the program, and they've got another Constitutional Convention underway. If you had a critical economic situation, that program could be pitched, and there are those, the big money powers particularly, 
of this nation and so forth who are gearing to do that very thing. See? All right, now, in that sense, though, Nephi and I want to conclude on this, then we'll get to some questions. I want you to see now 3rd Nephi chapter 21 in connection with 3rd Nephi chapter 22 in order to get this picture rounded out. Now, what's 3rd Nephi 21 about? Well, it starts with these alternatives that the Lord gives to the American Gentiles. And it explains that if they repent, they can come in and help build the new Jerusalem and be a blessed people on this land forever. And if they don't repent, and the time comes when they are ripe in iniquity, and that's the, that is the stipulation the Book of Mormon places on it, when the American Gentiles are ripe in iniquity, then the great promise concerning this land, that it is the land of Zion, and that people who, who live here will either serve the God of the land, who is Jesus Christ, and here again is the Book of Mormon emphasis on Christ, they'll serve the God of the land, who is Jesus Christ, or they will be swept off when the fullness of his wrath comes. Now, isn't that the Book of Mormon uh, uh, decree for this land? Now, in that sense, then, he gives them those alternatives here to the Gentiles in 3 Nephi 21. And then he talks about the building of the new Jerusalem and uh, the fact that the Gentiles will assist the Indian people. And some people have a hard one on that. Uh, President Joseph Fielding Smith made it clear, but we've still got problems on it. We think that when we go back to Jackson County, we're going to turn the keys of the kingdom over to some faithful Indian person, and we're going to build the new Jerusalem under his direction. Now, that's not true. Simply isn't true. Besides that, it's false. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> what is true is that Ephraim holds the birthright. And when the Lord talks about the redemption of Zion and the building of his kingdom, he says this, Behold, this is the blessing of the everlasting God upon the tribes of Israel. DNC 133, verse 34. And the richer blessing upon the head of Ephraim and his fellows. Now, why the richer blessing upon Ephraim? Because he's born the heat of the day. Because he holds the keys of presidency. He finally learns to exercise them, and I'm talking about us, not the prophet, to exercise the priesthood in righteousness and holiness and to truly become a Zion people, see. And the greater blessing than upon Ephraim as a result, see. So uh, uh, better stated then, those who are pure Gentiles will assist the Indian people, and uh, we're going to help them as the presiding uh, element in this whole program to build the new Jerusalem, hold the keys of power, help to elevate the Indian people, and to bring about the Lord's purposes. All right, now he then speaks then of, of, his, of his work among Israel and of his work now among the tribes of Israel and talks about the coming of the ten tribes, verse uh, 26, even the tribes which have been lost. And then verse 27, Yea, the works have commenced among all the dispersed of my people, and the gathering them in. And then he opens up with 3 Nephi 22. And what's 3 Nephi 22? Well, it's another complete chapter of Isaiah. It's Isaiah 54. And he says this, And then shall that which is written come to pass. See, after you, you see this whole prophetic picture, the cleansing of America or the repentance of America, whichever alternative we take, the building of the new Jerusalem, the gathering in of the house of Israel, the ten tribes, the Indian people are brought in, and then we see fulfilled Isaiah 54. And what does Isaiah say? He starts out by saying, By sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. Break forth into singing, thou that didst not travail with child. For more shall be the children of the desolate than of the married wife, saith the Lord. Oh, isn't that marvelous? By the way, what did I say? <coughs> <coughs> Let me quote it again. Then shall that which is written come to pass. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. 
Break forth into singing, and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child, for more shall be the children of the desolate than of the married wife, saith the Lord." Now, you can't understand that unless you've got a few keys of insight. Let me give them to you. The Lord is a married man. I don't know whether you people know that or not. In ancient times, he had a wife, and his wife was Israel. Okay? He said, I'm married to you. And he considers himself as being in a marriage relationship with his, with his people. For example, we say, prepare the bride, for the bridegroom cometh. Now, who's the bridegroom? Christ. Who's the bride? His wife. And who's his wife? His people. All right, now, in ancient, I said he's a married man, didn't I? All right, now, in ancient times, he had a wife in the sense that I'm talking about it. Let's make it clear. And that wife was Israel. And what happened with her? Well, she ran off with a traveling salesman. She forsook the Lord and went off doing things that were really critically out of line. And so what did the Lord do? He didn't have to divorce her. She just left. He says, for example, in another place in Isaiah, where's the bill of thy divorcement? Who put you away? I didn't. You just ran off. Okay? All right, so the Lord then found it necessary to choose another wife. And this other wife that he chose was the Gentiles. Okay? And the Gentiles then came into the covenant and occupied the place of Israel and were the Lord's favorite people. So that when, for example, Kipling writes the recessional, he says, when drunk with sight of power we loose wild tongues that have not thee in awe. Such boasting as the Gentiles use, or the lesser breeds without the law. See, the English people weren't Gentiles. Those are, the, those are these lesser breeds without the law. England was Israel. You see that? And uh, the Lord chose the Gentiles, made them his wife, and we have the times of the Gentiles. Now, when Isaiah is talking about this, he's talking about the next development when the Gentiles forsake the Lord, and when the program swings back and he begins to gather Israel. And so, speaking now of this time when he's going to gather Israel, this woman who in repentance now and sorrow comes back to hubby, and uh, he's going to say, Sing, O barren. Who is he talking about? Israel. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear. She hasn't brought forth any children through rebirth to Christ. The Jews haven't done that. Scattered Israel hasn't done that. They haven't brought forth people as Christ's wife to give to him as his children in the new covenant of regeneration and eternal life. They haven't done that. Okay? But when Israel is brought back in and the Gentiles reject, then you'll sing a joyful song. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing, thou that didst not travail with child. For more shall be the children of the desolate. Now, who are the desolate? Israel. There's going to be more children of the desolate than of the married wife. And who's the married wife? The Gentiles. The Gentiles. When you get down past the redemption of Zion, the new Jerusalem has been built or the center place, and the Indian people are brought in, the ten tribes are brought in, and Israel begins to be gathered from the nations of the earth in this great gathering of Israel to this land, to make it the land of Zion, the millennial land, the millennial kingdom, see, preparatory to that. When you do that, then you sit down and you number the people of the kingdom, and you'll find that there'll be more people who will come in from the pure Gentile lineage than from those of us who come through Gentile culture. And that's what he's saying, see. He's talking about a great transitional situation. Let me read you Orson Pratt on that. This is a statement that uh, Brother Pratt made in a discourse here in Salt Lake City, uh, clear back in 1875. He said, now I'm going to prophesy a little. The time when we shall be obliged to have a government to preserve ourselves in unity, because they, the American Gentiles, through the corruption that comes, he says, uh, uh, 
will not have power to govern, for state will be divided against state, city against city, town against town, and the whole country will be in terror and confusion, mob oxygen prevail, and there will be no security through this great republic for the lives and property of the people. He says, now when that time shall come, we shall necessarily want to carry out the great principles pertaining to law, order, government, and so forth. He says, we can magnify the Constitution and all be united without having Democrats or Republicans or all kinds of religions. We can magnify the Constitution in the spirit and the letter of it, though we're united in politics, religion, and everything else. And he talks about going back to Jackson County. He says, we expect to go back there. And when he do, he says, all that these people have shall be put into the hands of the servants of the Lord, and everyone will receive his stewardship at their hands without any law interfering from abroad. And they will fulfill and execute every law pertaining to their stewardship and pertaining to the income and the tithing thereof. And all will be fulfilled according to the letter of the law. This people will then be united and then will commence the fulfillment of that prayer of our Savior, repeated so frequently among all Christian nations, the portion of which says, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, how is it in heaven? Go to section 76. In heaven there's a celestial kingdom. That's where the source of law has its origin. Then there's a terrestrial kingdom, the honorable people of the earth, and so forth. And they're governed by a law related or centering in the celestial, and then from the celestial down to the telestial, right? Now, in order to have the will of God done on earth as it is in heaven, you've got to have an approximation of that. You've got to have a group of Latter-day Saints who are sanctified and who are living the celestial law, including that of consecration and stewardship, and who have the blessings of the Spirit, the endowment of glory, and the full Zion program as the prophets have foretold it. You've got to have that. And then you've got to have with that a saving of the Constitution. And as President Benson said at the BYU here a couple of years ago, you don't save it back east. You save it by the Latter-day Saints and faithful people on this land combining together. And as John Taylor put it, said, they will come to us and they'll say, we don't know anything about your religion and we don't care to know anything about it, but you do have a secure and a stable government. We want to support that and be part of it, though we don't particularly care anything about your religion, see. I was at the dedication of a welfare storehouse up in Rexburg when LeGrand Richards gave the dedicatory prayer, and right in the middle of that he quoted the whole statement from John Taylor and related it to the results that will flow from the welfare program. All right, now this will be the nucleus. This will be the nucleus. See, that will be the beginning of the nucleus. He says, but there will be an approximation to it here in these mountains. We will learn a great many pure principles to enable us to carry out the law as far as we possibly can under the circumstances that we're in here. But then when you redeem Zion, he says, there will be a full execution of that law. Now note what he says and how he quotes Isaiah 54. He's merely giving us a commentary in 3 Nephi 21 and 2. Now note what he says. He says, now that order of things will continue and will spread forth from that nucleus in Jackson County and the western counties of Missouri and the eastern counties of Kansas where this people will be located and it will spread abroad for hundreds and hundreds of miles on the right hand and on the left, east, west, north, and south from that great central city and all the people will be required to execute the law and all their stewardships and then there will be a oneness and union which will continue and it will spread wider and wider and become greater and greater Note this now, until the desolate cities of the Gentiles will be inhabited by the saints. Then we will fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah, and this is Isaiah 54, in which he says, and that's the next verse here that I haven't quoted yet, Thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities inhabited. Now let's go back and read Isaiah. Sing, O barren, thou that is not bear. Break forth in singing, and cry aloud, Thou that didst not travail with child. For more shall be the children of the desolate, when this transition takes place, than of the married wife. Enlarge the place of thy tent. Verse 2. Zion is likened to a tent with a center place, not a center stake, a center place, an administrative hub. 
and then with stakes supporting it round about. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitation. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes, for thou shalt break forth on the right hand, speaking of Zion, building up now after his judgments upon the Gentiles. For thou shalt break forth on the right hand, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles, and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. What desolate cities? The ones that he talked about, and he says, I will cut off the cities of thy land and throw down thy strongholds. You see that? And he goes on to say, Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed, speaking of Zion in this time. Neither shalt thou be confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth, and shall not remember the reproach of thy youth, and shall uh, of thy widowhood any more. He says, For thy maker, thy husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken, and grieved in spirit, a wife of youth, when thou wast refused, saith thy God. For a small moment have I have forsaken thee, with great mercies will I gather thee. And then he goes on to say, O afflicted, verse 11, tossed with tempest and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors and thy foundations with sapphires, and I will make thy windows of agates and thy gates of carbuncles and all thy borders of pleasant stones, and all thy children shall be taught of the Lord. See, this is the time when the Lord himself will be there and the blessings of the second comforter will be open to them and uh, there will be great prosperity. They will build up a city and an order of things that he speaks of here. And he goes on and says, In righteousness shalt thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppressed, for thou shalt not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near thee. Behold, they shall surely gather themselves against thee. That's the warfare against Zion. Uh, not by me, he says, whoso shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals and the fire and that bringeth forth an instrument of his work. I am in control of things, in other words. No weapon, he says, that's formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment shalt thou condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. How can we begin to get this great vision of the Book of Mormon? Can you see Nephi's vision of the warfare against Zion? Can you see, for example, how Jacob then amplifies it in 2 Nephi 6? How Nephi gets into it in 1 Nephi 22 and the Lord making bare his arm in the eyes of all nations? And then the Savior talking about this thing in relation to the Americans and the American remnants of Israel and... Uh, takes a chapter, a section right out of the prophecy about the Assyrian and uh, puts it in the Book of Mormon and says, I'll give you a key to what Micah 5 is all about. It's talking about America. And the Assyrian then is this great northern power, see. Now we've got some difficult times ahead. I hate to say that. But we've got some extremely difficult times ahead. We're in a situation where dissipation is running rampant in this land and where its economic uh, implications then lead to graft and greed and corruption and instability and to the mounting of personal and national and state debt to a situation where if we don't turn around, we're simply headed over the cliff. And when we do, and the Latter-day Saints begin to try and support and sustain that which is right and true, we get to the point where you even can't have a normal family without someone criticizing. You've got too many kids, and you can't be against abortion, and you can't be against drugs, and you can't be against living around with each other. See, I don't want Spencer on television teaching my kids about morals, and I don't want the great private detective in why you're doing it either. I don't want that, see. Even the best shows today, even the best shows today have what kind of a setting, see. And we're in that situation, and it's reflected in all that we do. And we cry out and wonder, how long? We've got a whole epidemic of, of, of AIDS 
running loose. And there is a cure for it. And it's called virtue. And it's simple. It doesn't cost any government funds. And it's simple. But we don't want to cure it that way, see? Now, we're in the midst of a Sodom Gomorrah situation, my brothers and sisters, where the day is long gone, where the Lord is going to forbear. And between now and the next few years, he's going to begin to come out in judgment and these great prophecies of Nephi will take place. And that's going to put us in a difficult situation, very difficult situation, because we're going to have to stand against the tide of the nation. And we're going to have to stand for correct principles and it will bring against us the warfare against Zion. And this will begin, this whole great scenario. It will finally end up in the cleansing of Zion, the establishment of the new Jerusalem, the gathering of Israel from the four quarters of the earth, the rise of Babylon, the uh, little horn, the rise of slaves against their masters and all of that. It's a real scenario, a real one, see. And in that sense, then, we're in the midst of it. And we need valiance. We need, above all, not just to learn theory, but we need to consecrate our lives and we need to get close to that Book of Mormon, and we need to get our home teaching done, not just our visiting around, and we need to begin getting alive to what the Book of Mormon is saying, and understand it, and apply it in our lives, and do what a 90-year-old prophet with all the energy of his soul is trying to get us to do, everything that he's got in the way of energy, he's committing to this objective. When his first prophetic, and I want to conclude on this, message came out in the Enzyme, April 1986. We've been used to a great prophet from the great state of Arizona, a great prophet who said, first of all, lengthen thy stride, and then who followed up on that and says, quicken thy pace. And he really put some emphasis on us. And then here we have a new prophet. And right up at the beginning of the page, the cleansing the inner vessel, you have this statement. I about fell off the chair when I read it. I literally about fell off the chair. Let me read it. We will be lengthening our stride in the future. Now, that's a different emphasis. To do so, we must first cleanse the inner vessel by awaking and arising, being morally clean, using the Book of Mormon and conquering pride. When we get to be a sanctified people, then we will really lengthen our stride, as President Benson says, in the future. Now, can you see the significance of all of this? I mean, this is a whole shift of emphasis. Not that the other was bad, but we've got here a man now who's giving us the thing that we most need. The thing we most need is the Book of Mormon. And if we don't learn that in the days of our peace, we simply will not survive. There simply will be no survival if we don't learn to be close to the Lord and really committed Latter-day Saints, building the kingdom, getting the work done, and done in the way that we're not just doing nuts and bolts but that we are actually ministering the gospel and the spirit of testimony and the gifts of the spirit in each other's lives and having that union that only the spirit of the Lord can bring where you finally get to where you see eye to eye when the Lord brings again Zion. See, I bear you my testimony that the Book of Mormon opens the picture in a very dreadful way. We've got two, three hour sessions yet to go. It opens the picture in a very, very dreadful way. And yet, on the other hand, it's a joyous time. It's a time when the Lord reserves some of the choicest spirits from all of his creations to be born on this earth to meet the challenge of this day and of this age. I bear you my testimony that we're in the midst of this, and whether we like it or not, the burden is ours to meet and to handle. I just pray, God, that for myself I can be what I ought to be, that I can be as humble as I ought to be, and that whatever I may know, 
Whatever I may know, the first thing I know is obedience to my bishop, and obedience to my stake president, and obedience to the prophet of the Lord. That's the first thing. And if anything I have conjured up or even know to be true is contrary to that, then I'll back off and say, I simply want to build a king you're running the show. And any way I can help, I'll help. And when we get to doing that and have the spirit of the Lord and the spirit of humility to do that, and then are patient with each other in our effort to learn the gospel and to apply it and to understand what this Book of Mormon is saying. It's a sealed book. We don't need to work for the sealed portion. It's a sealed book. And we need to be patient, but we need to learn it. Now, I've rambled on long enough. I just want you to know that, that I know that that Book of Mormon is the greatest miracle of modern times. I've been through that thing. I've studied the prophet Joseph Smith professionally. I've done that. 10, 15, 20 hours a day for 40, 50 years. And the bend result is that President Benson is a prophet, your bishop's been called of God, your state president's been called of God, the prophet is trying to get us to the Book of Mormon, and for goodness sake, let's finally get on the stick to do it. May the Lord bless us to do it, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. If you have some questions now, maybe we can bend the time just a little, can we, and take a minute or two. What is the scriptural reference to this world will stand next to Kola? There's no scriptural reference to that. It comes from uh, a couple of references. One is uh, from a close associate by the prophet Joseph Smith by the name of Addison Everett. And uh, he's talking about it, and he says, uh, I heard Joseph Smith say it. There's another uh, collection of materials of people who heard Joseph Smith's teachings in the historian's office in Salt Lake City, and you find it also there. And then you have, if you want to get my uh, book, God, Man, and the Universe, and read the story of the creation here, I quote a lot of this corroborating statements, both from Scripture and... Uh, from uh, uh, other works. For example, in the, in the fifth chapter of the book of Abraham, verse 11, uh, the uh, Lord is talking about uh, Adam in the Garden of Eden. And the gods took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the gods commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the time thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now, Abraham interpolates this statement of explanation. He says, Now I, Abraham, saw that it was after the Lord's time, which was after the time of Kolob, for as yet the gods had not appointed unto Adam his reckoning. Now, before the fall, when this earth was created, it was created and it stood next to Kolob, and it was governed by Kolob's time. Joseph Smith taught that. All the early brethren who were close to him taught that. And then when this earth fell, it wasn't just Adam and Eve eating whatever it was, and it wasn't an apple, I don't think, but it wasn't so much the apple on the tree as it was the pear on the ground, you know. But nevertheless... Uh, when they did that, when they did that, then not only did it change them in a physical sense, Adam didn't have blood before, and the spiritual physical features were withdrawn, or the spiritual features, but this whole earth then was moved and placed in the solar system, and the sun then began to be our light. Now there's statement after statement on that. And then in the restoration, this won't take place at the beginning of the millennium, it'll wait till after the millennial period with the new celestial earth, then, as Joseph says, the earth will be rolled back into the presence of God and crowned with celestial glory. And as Brigham Young and John Taylor and others clarified, rolled back means taken back, stands next to Kolob's scene. Okay? So there's no scriptural, this statement closest is the Abraham 5.11 and the subsequent verses statement on the position of the earth, but scripturally it doesn't say that in the sense that you can quote a scripture and put a handle on it in that sense. 
Any other questions? Can you stand and shout aloud? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. In other words, when you add up the number of the ten tribes in their return and the Indian people who will come in by nations and by large groups, and you add then the other people of Israel that come, and then you compare them with us Gentiles, and I'm talking about us Gentiles in the cultural sense. Blood-wise, we are of Ephraim, but culturally we're Gentiles. But there'll be more people then that come from these other sources than from the Gentile culture source. That's what Isaiah is saying in Isaiah 54, which the Savior quotes. Okay? Comment here. Uh, do you have any comments on the assassinations of uh, Elder Ball and Elder uh, Wilson? Except that I just abhor it. And uh, I don't know, it's just one of the symptoms of the times. We're going to see a situation, as the Prophet Joseph Smith put it, uh, this is uh, uh, the teachings, page 160 and 61, where he says, The time is coming when no man will have any peace but in Zion and in her stakes. And he further clarifies, he says, uh, uh, There will be here and there a stake of Zion for the gathering of the saints. Some may have cried peace, but the saints in the world will have little peace from henceforth. He says, let this not hinder you from gathering. He says, there your children shall be blessed in the stakes of Zion, and you in the midst of friends where you may be blessed. He says, we ought to have the building up of Zion as our greatest object. When war shall come, we will have to flee to Zion. And read section 45, beginning with verse 66 in the Doctrine and Covenants, where the time will come when you'll either take up your sword against your neighbor or you'll have to flee into Zion. And it's just symptomatic of that breakdown which is rapidly proceeding and which will finally bring about that ultimate era of chaos and turmoil where Zion is the only people that has any kind of real stability. There'll be groups of people, the Latter-day Saints and the, and the remnant the Lord shall call and Jewish people and so forth, but that will be the general situation that we're headed for. Give us just another few years and we're going to get there rapidly. Well. <clears throat> Part of the cleansing that we will see in the chronology where we see the the country from the north coming against America, which is to address them. Well, let me just, can I express a personal view? I think we're going to keep on business as usual until we finally go over the cliff. I seriously believe we're headed for a national collapse financially. I've looked at the prophecies about the elders saving the Constitution. There's nothing in them that says we're going to save it in Washington, D.C. I've been teaching that for years. I went through all of those prophecies. I, in fact, I found some. I personally found some no one else had found before. And they do not indicate that we're going to go back and reestablish and stabilize the Gentile order. What they do indicate is that in this whole trauma that then takes place, that we will finally lift the Constitution out of the dust after it has been trampled upon. And we will make it a part of our program. And as we do, as we do, then you will offer constitutional freedom and liberty to all people. But it will be done here with the Latter-day Saints as a key factor, combined then with other freedom-loving peoples in this land. You see that? And in that sense, then, uh, there will be this dear curation, and it may come over our effort to save the Constitution, but there will be a warfare against Zion. And now as that warfare against Zion, and the Book of Mormon in indicates that it will begin with America. And that's what section 112 indicates. It will begin with America. America making war against the saints. And as that takes place, then, and it gets underway, and the American economy then goes under, then we're going to have a situation. Did you see this television serial called America, spelled with a K? Well, that's what's in for it. 
It's that kind of a situation. We're having the situation of the coming of the Assyrian, the northern army, and it will raise havoc on this land. It will cleanse this land like we have never been cleansed since the Nephites were destroyed. And through the Lord's intervention, then finally, and this is where the prophecy and war comes in. We'll talk about that tomorrow night, where the, end, where the slaves rise against their masters, and those slaves are those who are held in dominion by the Russian forces, the people of Hungary, Poland, and so forth. When the, when the uh, uh, Russian military might is trampling over here, what would you do if you were a freedom fighter in, in over there? Well, it would be a mass upheaval and up, an uprising, an assertion of liberty. And when that takes place, then those who are directing that force against America are going to have to withdraw their forces here. And with the power that we can muster, and uh, particularly with the powers of the Holy Priesthood, when Isaiah says that the Assyrian will be turned back by reason of the anointing, then you'll finally get that force cleared out of this land. It will leave this land in, in shambles, and the Indian people will go through among the Gentiles. And meantime, the Latter-day Saints then will do their program of upholding and sustaining the Constitution, extending its blessings about, and then with the cleansing and with that program put in gear, then you'll begin the Great Gathering. Now that's the, the scenario as I see it for about the next decade of time or so. That's the scenario, and I'm just giving you now a personal view on it. Yes, two gatherings. Now let me put it this way. If you read the revelations in the Doctrine and Covenants, you find that the Lord gave the land of Missouri to the Latter-day Saints. When the Indian people are gathered in into the New Jerusalem, they will receive the gospel, they will receive the program, they'll, they'll go back into their lands, build temples, but essentially the land in and around the center place of Zion, the Lord has given to Ephraim. But the whole of America will finally become the Zion of God, and you'll establish an order of government that will finally bring sanity to Central and South America, to their politics, and uh, be the means then of building a great bulwark of strength and power on the Western Hemisphere. This happens before then the, the forces then now of, of opposing, finally then can't cope with Zion, and so they shift and say, well, we're going to shut your water off at Jerusalem. You think there's going to be two great powers, we're going to shut it off. And so the forces of the Gentiles and of the northern army, or the Assyrian, or uh, uh, the Little Horn, go then against Jerusalem. And that will be the great final winding up scene where the Lord himself will finally intervene to save the Jews. That's right. That's right. Many of our young people will live to see the Savior of the world and to have a personal association with him. That's what the prophetic picture implies. Now, we don't know the full schedule of years, and I'm not trying to say, but we are close enough to that, to where that can be said closely. See, we get the idea the second coming is the great world appearance. No, I want to talk about that later in the week. He will come to Zion. He will come to his temple. He will come to Adam on Diamon. There are several major appearances that take place here. And this then preliminary to that great world appearance. Now we've got something to do, my brothers and sisters. We've got a kingdom to establish in righteousness, and that takes the sanctification of the people and the understanding of what the Lord has said. We've got to finally get on the stick and do it and quit fiddling around and get our home teaching done and our ministry and building the Spirit of the Lord and help sanctifying and forgiving each other of the, of the stresses and the conflicts and build that strength and that union and that understanding in our midst that we need to be a Zion people. We've got a prophet of the Lord who's just begging us to do that and to use the Book of Mormon to that end. Now the Lord bless us. I appreciate the opportunity. This is only the first day of it. We've got three more, two more. I want you to know I'm going to endure to the end. I'll be here on Saturday night. <laughs>
lot of it's already happening, isn't it? But I'm talking about, uh, I'm on the High Council there at the Alpine Stake. And uh, here about oh, a year ago, our state presidency brought in the film of a regional representative who was in on the know in the uh, country and in what he's talking about. And he's talking about the plans of the Russians uh, in regard to America. I don't know whether you've heard that or seen that around here, but it was a real uh, eye-opener coming from a, a very authoritative source. But there's that kind of thing. I, uh, and I'm not trying to say, I'm just saying here's what the prophecies say. Now you take them and pray about them, and if we can't find out the full details, let's at least get our lives in order. And that means I want to go home and tell my bishop that I love him. And I want to tell my stake president I love him too. See, and I have. You see that? And let's get united and let's get under the leadership of our prophet and find out what he's saying and do it. Well, thanks again. Have a good evening. It's been great to be with you.